Hello there, my fellow Raven lovers, and welcome to another episode of 40k lore about the loyalist Primarch Corvus Corax. Last time we introduced the Raven Lord, talked a bit about his early days, the liberation of his home planet of Lycaeus, renamed afterwards into Deliverance, and his meeting of the Emperor. Today we are going to be talking about three of the more notable campaigns, or events, however you want to call them, that Corax and the Raven Guard took part in during the Great Crusade. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn more about the 19th Primarch and his legion, shall we? One of the more notable campaigns carried out by Corax and his Raven Guard Legion during the Great Crusade was the Imperial Compliance of the Istvan system, located in the northern reaches of the Ultima Segmentum, far beyond the established heartlands of the Imperium. And before you ask, yes, it is that Istvan. However, this is before Horus turned traitor, and the Loyalist massacres which took place there. Though cut off, scout vessels ranging ahead of Corax's 27th Expeditionary Fleet had found evidence that human life on Istvan III had managed to maintain a largely cohesive industrialized society which had endured the millennia intact, making it a high priority for contact and absorption into the Imperium. A long-standing autochthonic culture was prevalent on Istvan III which included endemic local mysticism and religious practices. This, coupled with a history of independence, meant that once contacted by the forerunners of the Great Crusade, the Istvanians had first demurred and then denied compliance with the imperial truth. Given the strategic importance of gaining the life-sustaining and industrialized star system with its large human population for the Imperium, a priority was given to achieving the compliance of the Istvan system. The War Council had one caveat when issuing the order that precluded the use of overwhelming force in order to avoid excessive collateral damage that would spoil this valuable prize. The task of bringing the Istvan system back into Imperial compliance fell to Korax and his Raven Guard Legion, as the warriors of the 19th had a reputation for using surgical strikes and precision in such matters. The black hulled strike cruisers and gunships of the Raven Guard attacked without warning, systematically destroying Istvan Free's military infrastructure and taking charge of its seats of governance. The military forces of the indigenous Istvanians were professional soldiers who did not break easily even when confronted with the might of the Adeptus Astartes. There was some resistance, but the last elements of the aggressive faction were destroyed by the Raven Guard at a place called the Red Arf Valley on Istvan Frey. An Istvanian delegation formally surrendered before the Primarch Corax, and the 800 companies of Raven Guard Space Marines that comprised the 19th Legion. The Istvanians kneeled before their sable armored conquerors as a defeated foe, but were welcomed into the fold as men of the Imperium. Though they had waged war against each other, the Imperial truth had prevailed, and the Istvanians had sworn to accept its teachings. By proving themselves men of wisdom and civilization, they were deemed fitting partners for the many other worlds of the Imperium. The Remembrancer Order had not yet been foisted upon the Space Marine Legions by the Council of Terra at this time, but a substantial civilian contingent was left behind to begin the integration of the Istvanian population with the Imperial Truth. Vardas Prawl was left behind as the world's Imperial Planetary Governor to command Istvan Free in the name of the Emperor to ensure continued compliance and manage the dismantling of the traditional religious structures that defined the planet's autochthonous society. The established capital located at the sprawling protohive of Kry Vanak, Istvan Free's political and cultural capital, was chosen as the site of imperial power. 
Unknown to Korax and the Raven Guard, they would return 15 years later to the Istvan system, to the world of Istvan V, to bring the rebel Horus to account. The Battle of Gate 42 It was the need to conduct war in a more conventional manner that led to one of the greatest setbacks of the 19th Legion's history and one that would foreshadow the horrible events at Istvan V a few years later. Soon after Horus was declared Imperial War Master, the Raven Guard was recalled from operations along the coreward edge of the Ghoul Stars and ordered to take its place in a line alongside several other legions under the War Master's direct command. The Occam Sophus Cluster had been brought into Imperial compliance by the Luna Wolves in the opening years of the Great Crusade, but its people had fallen to a form of mass psychosis and violently rejected unity with Terra. This unheralded secession was later determined to have been caused by Xenos parasites, which matured within the eye sockets of their hosts, in this case the unfortunate population of the cluster. As they matured, the parasites gained rudimentary control over their hosts and formed what amounted to a wholly alien gestalt consciousness focused on a cabal of primary hosts, dubbed the Unsighted Kings. The newly ascended Warmaster Horus refused to see the cluster of worlds he himself had brought into compliance slip from the Imperium's grip, and so he vowed an oath of moment to reclaim the worlds no matter the cost. Horus had formulated a plan to cast down the unsighted kings in a lightning war that would purge the afflicted population while still retaining the cluster's highly developed infrastructure for future repopulation. Furthermore, a rapid victory would demonstrate to Horus's brother Primarchs that the Emperor had been correct to elevate him to such a high rank. The Warmaster's plan called for the bulk of four legions, the Luna Wolves, the Space Wolves, the Iron Warriors, and the Raven Guard, to converge on a heavily fortified lair of the Unsighted Kings before a final overwhelming assault was launched. Having brought the Outer Worlds of the Cluster to heal in a matter of solar weeks, the War Master called a council of his brother Primarchs, one part of his plan calling for the Raven Guard to make a frontal assault directly into the guns of the defenders of Gate 42. Korax argued against what he denounced was a waste of resources and a needless squandering of his warriors' lives, countering with a strategy of his own. The Raven Lord proposed that his legion should draw off enemy forces in a series of feints, allowing the three other legions to overwhelm what defenders remained at the walls with comparative ease. In answer, Perturabo accused Korax of seeking to avoid battle a crime verging on their election of duty for a Primarch of the Legiones Astartes. The two very nearly came to blows, with only the intervention of Lehman Russ staying the bloodshed. The Wolf King counseled Korax to heed the words of the Primarch who the Emperor had set above his brothers. Russ urged Korax to smooth his bitterness, but not to extinguish it and allow that guttering flame to kindle the fire necessary to carry the battle through. Taking his leave of the council, Korax mustered the Raven Guard before Gate 42. Knowing their particular demeanor would carry them forward, Korax assigned many of his Terran-dominated companies to the van, in particular those whose captains appeared most willing to play their part in the War Master's plan. The assault that followed was hailed as the Legion's darkest hour, a grim honor that, tragically, would be displaced a few years later on Estvan V. At the height of the battle, the assault companies were decimated in the face of overwhelming fire. Korax himself led the forlorn hope, his battle cry firing the 19th Legion to such efforts that a breach was carried and Gate 42 eventually taken. The honor of slaying the unsighted kings was claimed by Horus as War Master, and at the moment of their execution, the Xenos' hold over the population was dispelled. The Occam Sophus cluster was delivered, and the War Master's prize was reclaimed. 
The cost, however, was terrible. For not only had countless millions of hosts been crippled in mind and body, but thousands of the Raven Guard, the bulk of them Terranborn, had given their lives before the shattered walls. Though the Battle of Gate 42 was considered a victory by and for Horus, its effects were far-reaching. The 19th Legion was sorely depleted, leaving only 80,000 legionaries under the Primarch's command and making it one of the smallest of the Legiones Astartes. Korax removed himself and his legion from his brother's command, swearing bitterly never to serve alongside Horus again. One last consequence of the Battle of Gate 42 lingers still. In its aftermath, those line officers, who before the coming of the Primarch had served for so long under Horus's command, were gone, and so the War Master was able to exert little in the way of influence over the Raven Lord's legion. Many of those Terrans had been inducted into the warrior lodges, and with their deaths, these unseen bodies all but vanished from the Raven Guard. It was claimed by his detractors that in assigning the Terranborn legionaries to the assault wave that would suffer the greatest losses, Korax did his legion a service, consolidating his power and paving the way for a future more in line with his own vision. As a result, the Legion was largely spared the wave of insurrection that was transmitted through so many other Legions by the hidden auspices of the Lodges. The Scouring of the Scalan Sector A two-year engagement through a sector of space claimed by the remnants of the broken Eldar race, the Scaland campaign was to serve as the original field test for the first thousand sets of prototype power armor that would later come to be designated as Mark VI, though at the time it bore the provisional designation Mark V. Small numbers of the Mark V armor had already been submitted to the Iron Warriors and Salamander Legions, and both had expressed reservations about the lack of heavy plating when compared to earlier models, pushing for the Mark V to be revised for a heavy assault role. It was deemed that a mass combat trial was required to determine the effectiveness of the original design before potentially abandoning it. Internal politics within the various Legion commands saw this honor bestowed upon the Raven Guard, depleted in number after the bloody fighting in the Occam Sophus cluster. Speculation at that time suggested that a faction among the Primarchs and Legion commanders, led by Perturabo, intended this assignment to an understrength legion to be the death knell of the Mark VI armor, leading to its replacement by a sturdier design. If this was the plan, then it was to backfire spectacularly, for the Raven Guard performed admirably in the verdant Eldar worlds of the Scallon Sector. Utilizing the advanced autosenses and agility of the new armor to hound the Eldar into a series of strike and fade attacks, which decimated their already battered military forces. Such was the success of the fighting in the Scallon sector that it eventually saw the expulsion of the Eldar and the Imperium's claim to its rich worlds. Afterwards, not only was the Mark VI armor approved for its final deployment, but the majority of the improvements suggested by the Raven Guard were also adapted. The new armor, later dubbed Corvus Pattern Power Armor, in honor of the Raven Guard, was placed into full-scale production only a few months before the outbreak of Horus's rebellion. It was once again redesignated as Mark VI from Mark V by the Mechanicum to account for the inclusion of the many stopgap field modifications and repairs into the Legionis Astartes order of battle. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about Korax's campaigns from the Great Crusade for today. In the next episode, I do believe I will talk in some length about the Dropsite Massacre and Korax's survival of it. If you have any thoughts or questions, do not hesitate in leaving them in the comments below. As usual, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button and maybe subscribe for more videos. 
And if you're a generous soul, you can always help out my channel by going to my Patreon page. The link is in the video description, where even a couple of dollars can help out a great deal. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you a great day. The Emperor protects.